get through singing that song, it's sort of like when I get through preaching, you're worn out. <laughs> but these are great songs that we've been singing, aren't they? Well, when I go to visit a place as I have this one, I'm always glad to stay as long as I'm supposed to stay, and when that time is, has expired, I'm ready to go home to Arlene. So tomorrow morning, Lord willing, I'm going to leave here fairly early. I won't call any of you before I go and drive over to Orlando and hopefully the rough weather that they're predicting around Dallas will be far enough north that my plane can fly in there. But it's been such a joy for me to be here. You've been so very, very kind to me in every way. And I'm going to remember these few days for a long, long time. In my experience of life, I have found that ever so often, someone walks across the stage of life that affects my life, and they seem to be a little taller than the rest of us. And I found Bob to be that kind of man. And I am very, very impressed with Brian's depth of understanding of Scripture, his dedication to the truth, and the great work he's doing in training preachers. And I know that there are others like Daniel who are participating in that as well, but that is such a great work. I was telling Brian today that one of my favorite teachers in graduate school when I was at Harding in Memphis, Tennessee, was Jack Lewis, one of the great scholars of our time and maybe of, of other times as well in the church. And the major building on the campus of Harding burned. And Jack Lewis's office was in that building. And when in the middle of the night they heard that the building was on fire, he and his wife went over and they could do little more than just watch it burn. And Jack Lewis said to his wife, well, there goes a lifetime of work because he had his library, his papers, and many things in the building. But his wife said, no, Jack. The lifetime of work that you have done will live on in the students you have taught who are influencing people around the world. And that's what you're doing in your preacher school. And I congratulate you upon it. And I want to say again that I appreciate very much Chad's leading of the singing each night. And he has, as you have noticed, coordinated the songs with the message for that evening. And I think that adds something. And not only did he choose the right songs, but he led them in a powerful way. So this has just been a very uh, wonderful experience for me. And I thank every one of you for it. I find it interesting that the gospel writers do not go into detail about the sufferings of Christ. They simply say they scourged him. Or as in our text tonight, the very first verse that we read, Luke simply says, there they crucified him. No real details about his suffering. I want us to begin tonight by analyzing that brief statement, there they crucified him. It was there on a little hill outside of the walls of Jerusalem. It was called Golgotha, Cranian or Calvaria. 
It was the place of the skull. I've stood before that little hill, and it is shaped like a human skull, and it has caves in the side of it corresponding to the eyes and the nose and the mouth of the skull. It, it looks like a skull, but it was a place of execution. And it was there on that hill that they crucified him. In noting the place, I would say that it, first of all, was a conspicuous place. Because John tells us that many Jews saw him there. It was on a road going into the city. And it was very conspicuous. It was a shameful place. He died between two thieves as though he were the vilest of the three. And it was a solitary place because he died there alone. And the text says there they crucified him. The second word is they crucified him. Who crucified Jesus? Well, we could say the Jews did because they were the ones who cried for his blood. And when Pilate, the Roman governor, wanted to release him, it was they who said, let him be crucified. The Jews crucified him. But the Romans also crucified him because they carried out the penalty of death. But it's a lot more personal than that because you and I crucified him. For he died for our sins. It was there that they crucified him. And the third word is crucified. It is the most agonizing way of death ever invented by men. Had the Jews put Jesus to death on their own, they would probably have stoned him. But the prophets had predicted it correctly. They would pierce his hands and his feet. He would be crucified. And it was there that they crucified him. The fourth word is him. The only man who ever lived who did nothing wrong, who never one time disappointed his father. He was an innocent man. But it was there that they crucified him. I think that it's fitting in dealing with the great fundamental truths of the gospel that we close our time together by looking at the meaning of the cross. Our theme has been based upon Luke 1 and verse 1 where Luke said he was setting forth things most surely believed among us. And through the years the churches of Christ have been made up of people who believe these fundamental truths. And they need to be taught again and again. Everybody needs to know them, and those who know them need to be reminded of these great and profound truths. And in things most surely believe, believed among us, we've talked about the majesty of God and the worship of the church and the identity of Christ, the words of the Holy Spirit. And last night we looked at the New Testament church. And tonight, the meaning of the cross. This sermon will be delivered in a way that is a bit different than the others have been delivered because what I want to do tonight is to present a narrative of the events covered by the gospel writers of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. 
And then as we come to the conclusion of the study, I want to ask the question, what does the cross of Christ mean to us? And with that, let us proceed. And I want us to begin with the procession. The procession that set out from the governor's palace and passed through the narrow winding streets of Jerusalem where crowds had gathered because people wanted to know what was happening. And there might have been a centurion leading the procession. He might have been riding on a white horse. His mouth might have been drawn up tightly because he had a job to do and he wanted to get it done. And following him, there may have been two rows of soldiers. They were Roman soldiers with their helmets and their shields and their spears. And had we been there that day, we would have noticed that between those two rows of soldiers, there were three men bearing crosses. And we would have known that upon those crosses, they soon would die. But had we been in the crowd, we would have spatially ever noticed one of those men the one with the hideous crown of thorns on his head. And from the wounds of those thorns, there must have been blood and sweat running down his face. And we would have noted, no doubt, that his garment was soaked with his own blood because the night before he had experienced the Roman scourging. A few years ago, Mel Gibson put out a movie entitled The Passion of the Christ. I saw that picture and it was the most, one of the most brutal things I've ever seen. And one of the most brutal was the Roman scourging. As I sat in the theater that night, I noticed that as that movie ran, nobody was talking to one another. No one was eating popcorn. They were just riveted on the screen. And when the movie was ended, people were reluctant to leave. But it wasn't because they wanted to visit with each other because I didn't see anyone say a word. There was total silence. And after a while, as people began to rise and to file out of the theater, they weren't talking to each other. Later on, someone asked me, do you think the scourging scene was overdone? And my answer was no. Because while the gospel writers, as stated earlier, do not go into detail about the suffering of Christ, the Roman scourging was terrible beyond description. The Jews had a law that when they beat a man, they could not give him more than 40 stripes. And in order that they might not exceed the limit, they always stopped at 39. But the Romans had no such law. And they could beat a man at the scourging stake until he died, and many did die there. The victim was tied to a low pillar or post so that he was in a bent position. His clothing was torn from his body. And a Roman soldier skilled in the art of the whip would take the whip with thongs of leather in the end of it and tied in each of those thongs would be a piece of bone or metal. 
and he knew just when to crack the whip over the back of the victim so that the bone or metal would dig into the flesh and sometimes the bones were exposed and they crucified Jesus. But before they crucified him, they scourged him. And in the scourging, Jesus bled. So we might have noted that his garments were soaked with blood. And it almost seemed as though he was about to collapse because of the ordeal of the night before. We do know that someone else bore his cross to the place of execution. There was a man who was in Jerusalem that day. He had traveled over 500 miles across the Mediterranean Sea from Cyrene in North Africa to observe a Jewish feast day. He didn't come to Jerusalem to see a man suffer. He came to worship. He didn't intend to be a part of the crowd, but he must have just been caught up in it and swept along with it. But he was there. And while it is not specifically stated in Scripture, it seems that Jesus fell beneath the weight of the cross. Because as a part of the penalty of crucifixion, the victim carried his own cross. But Simon was selected by the Romans to carry the cross of Jesus. Therefore, I conclude it was because Jesus could not bear it. And there's an interesting sidelight to Simon of Cyrene. The Gospel of Mark, we believe, was written for a Roman audience. You know, each of the Gospel records looks at the life of Christ from a slightly different standpoint. And each one had his specific audience and his specific purpose. We believe Mark was written for a Roman audience. And it's interesting that when Mark tells us that Simon of Cyrene bore the cross of Jesus, he is careful to say that Simon is the father of Rufus and Alexander. None of the others tell us that. And to identify Simon as the father of Rufus and Alexander would suggest that the readers of Mark would know who they were. Later on, the Apostle Paul wrote a letter to the church in Rome. And in chapter 16, he is greeting a number of people who he knew were in Rome. And among those he greeted was one whose name was Rufus. And he said, greet Rufus and his mother who has been like a mother to me. And we cannot help but wonder if this is the Rufus of Mark, the brother of Alexander. And if this is the Rufus who is the son of Simon who bore the cross of Christ, and if he is, then Simon must have become a disciple. And perhaps he taught his wife and his children the truths of Jesus. And the whole family might have become disciples, but that is conjecture. But it's interesting to contemplate. Simon bore the cross of Christ. And it was there in those streets of Jerusalem that Jesus turned and spoke to certain women in the crowd. They were the same women who had followed him from Galilee and had 
been servants of Jesus and his disciples. And they were weeping. They were wondering, why is this happening? And Jesus turned to them and said, Women, do not weep for me, but weep for yourselves and your, for your children. For if they do these things in a green tree, what shall be done in a dry? What did Jesus mean by that? Well, the Romans and the Jews were about to crucify an innocent man. It's a green tree. But the days would come, not many years hence, when the Romans would march upon Jerusalem and destroy the city, would kill hundreds and thousands of people and carry many of them into slavery. But they were guilty of forgetting God and turning away from the will of God. And if they will kill an innocent man in a green tree, what's going to happen to the guilty? The Bible writers tell us that they brought Jesus. They brought Jesus to the hill called Golgotha. The word brought can mean to drag or even to carry. And I wonder, because remember he was scourged, he had been up all night, he had been despitefully used and criticized. And they brought him to Golgotha. Now let's move from that to the place of execution. When they arrived at the top of that hill, the people in the crowd were shouting one thing and another. There were people there that day who were glad that Jesus was dying. They wanted to be rid of him. They had cried for his blood. They had said, let him be crucified. And they must have laid the cross on the ground, placed the body of Jesus upon it, and a Roman soldier who no doubt had done this much before took a mallet and took a nail of iron and with a single blow drove it through the hands of Jesus and another through his feet, and a hush must have fallen upon the crowd because it is not pleasant to see Roman iron pierce human flesh. But then they lifted the cross in an upright position, and it must have fallen with a sickening thud into its place, the hole that was prepared for it, and there suspended between heaven and earth was the sinless, perfect Son of God. And then the crowd began to shout again. One said one thing, another said another. They threw his words back at him. Among other things, they said he saved himself or he saved others. Himself he cannot save. And you know they were right about that. He did save others, but himself he could not save. Or he could have come down from the cross. He had earlier said that he could pray his father and the father would send 12 legions of angels to deliver him but they were right when they said he saved others himself he could not save because had he saved himself he could not have been our savior. Amen. 
And amid the shouting of the multitude, Jesus spoke from the cross. Maybe only a few or maybe none heard. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And looking down from the cross, Jesus saw his mother in the crowd. She was standing by John, the beloved disciple. And Jesus said, Woman, behold your son, and son, behold your mother. He was asking John to take care of his mother. Even in his own suffering and as he was dying, he was thinking of others. We remember from John 7, 1 through 5, that during the ministry of Christ, his brothers, and we know he had at least four brothers because they're named in Scripture, but his brothers did not believe on him. Now later, one of his brothers, James, became a pillar in the Jerusalem church. But they didn't believe on him during his ministry, and so Jesus gave his mother's care to John. Undoubtedly, he would rather a disciple care for his mother than his unbelieving brothers. Then he said to a thief who died with him, Today you'll be with me in paradise. And now there was a dark cloud coming down from the mountain. And that cloud shut out the light of the sun even though it was midday. And out of the darkness Jesus said, I thirst. Then he cried, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? There are those who would have us believe that Jesus was delirious and really didn't know what he was saying. But he knew quite well what he was saying. And he was speaking of a fact that his father had forsaken him. One of the great preachers of another generation was G.C. Brewer. In preaching on the cross of Christ, he tried to imagine what was occurring in heaven as Jesus died on Golgotha. And he imagined that the angels of God were all standing at attention before the throne of God, waiting for the command to come and deliver the Son, but that the command never came, and instead God turned away from his Son. And perhaps by the darkness descending upon that scene, we could say God refused to look upon his sinless son as he died. You see, God can have nothing to do with sin. And Jesus was bearing the sin of the world. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, that Jesus became sin for us. He didn't become a sinner, but he took the place of the sinner. He became sin for us who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. When he took our sin upon himself, God turned away. And then Jesus said, it is finished. There were many things that were finished, but primarily the work of Christ that led to that moment was done. Before him, there was the resurrection. Before him was his glorification in heaven, where as our high priest, the writer of Hebrews says, he went with his own blood to offer it in the presence of God for us. Do not ever leave Jesus in the grave. To be our Savior, he had to be raised. He had to take his blood before the Father so that we could be cleansed. And then finally he said, perhaps as a 
prayer that he had learned as a child. It's a quotation from the book of Psalms. It might have been an evening prayer that the family would say, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. And he died. When Jesus died, there was darkness over all of that part of the earth from high noon till three o'clock. There was an earthquake. The veil in the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. That's significant. Had any man torn that curtain, it would have been torn from bottom to top. This is an act of God. The curtain is torn from top to bottom, suggesting that now the way into heaven, pictured by the most holy place of the temple, was open because of Christ's death there that day. And in that darkness, when Jesus died, the Roman centurion who was in charge of all those events said, surely this was the Son of God. Who do you believe died between those two thieves that day? Surely this was the Son of God. And if he was and is the Son of God, and he died there for our sins, then we need to respond to the Christ of the cross. Now I want to ask, what does all that mean to us? And there are three things I want to say. First of all, the death of Christ on Calvary's hill speaks of the tragedy of human sin because it was sin, your sins and mine, that nailed him there. At the heart of the gospel, Paul said Christ died for our sins. He was buried and he rose again the third day. the tragedy of human sin. And you see, none of us are free from sin. The Bible says that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That's Romans 3 and verse 23. The Bible says that sin separates us from God. Isaiah 59, 1 and 2 tells us that. And separated from God, we can have no life that is spiritual or eternal, unless God acts on our behalf. And in the cross, he was acting on our behalf. So that we can not only live physically, but that we can live spiritually in a relationship with him and that we could experience eternal life in the home of the soul. And Romans 6 and verse 23 says, the wages of sin is death. That is the human predicament. We all have sinned. Sin separates us from God. And the end result of sin is eternal separation from God, eternal death. The tragedy of human sin is seen in the cross. And we must see ourselves there. Number two... In the cross we see the wonder of the love of God. The Bible says in what is sometimes called the golden text of Scripture, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. God so loved, that's a little adverb of degree showing us the extent to which God loved us. God so loved, look at the cross, he so loved us. 
I've told you earlier this week that I have a son. I'm proud of my son. I can't think of anybody that I would give him for. But God gave his son for sinners like you and me. No wonder that Romans 5 verses 8 and 9 tell us God commends his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. We were not the friends of God, we were his enemies. We were not so good that Jesus died, we were sinners bound for eternal ruin. And while we were sinners, Christ died for us. I love the statement of John in 1 John 3 where he begins by saying, Behold. It's as though he says, Stand off a bit. I want you to gaze upon something of great importance. He said, Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. Notice the words, what manner, in describing God's love. What manner of love the Father has bestowed. Those two words translate an original phrase that is used when the angel of the Lord appeared to Mary to announce to her that she was to be the mother of the Son of God. And she didn't fully understand it. And scripture says she cast in her mind as to what manner of salutation that was. What manner means something amazing, something surprising, something wonderful. And Mary said this is amazing and surprising and wonderful that I should be called the mother of the Son of God. It's also used in the 14th chapter of Matthew when the disciples were on the Sea of Galilee and there was that storm and, and Jesus came walking across the water to their ship and, and they were afraid and Jesus said, don't be afraid, it's, it's, it is I. And Peter, the, the one who was always ready to speak, said, Lord, if that's really you, let me come to you walking on the water. And the Lord said, come on. And Peter got down out of that boat and began to walk across the water. And all was well until he took his eyes off of Jesus and he began to look at the waves and then he began to sink. And Jesus said, oh, you of little faith, and stretched forth his hand and brought him up. He got into the boat with them, and the disciples marveled, saying, What manner of man is this? You see, Jesus they recognized as somebody wonderful and surprising and amazing. And that's how John describes the love of God. It's wonderful that God should love us. It's amazing that he should love us at all because we were not lovable. We were not loving him first or even loving him back. It's amazing that God would love us. And John said, stand back a bit and look upon the wonderful, surprising, and amazing love of God what manner of love the Father has bestowed. We didn't earn it, he gave it. That we should be called the sons or the children of God. What kind of love is that? And sometimes we sing the wonderful song that ends by saying, love so amazing, so divine, demands my life, my soul, my all. He loved us so. Won't all of us love him back? 
And the last thing that I want to note with you tonight is that there is a wonderful opportunity that belongs to us. There is an urgency of this hour tonight because all of us are going to respond one way or another to the cross. And how will you respond? Do you remember a little while ago I was talking about the words that Jesus spoke from the cross? And do you remember that one of those words included, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do? Do you think God heard Jesus pray those words? If God did not hear his perfect sinless son of God in the hour of his greatest need, what hope do I have, a poor sinner, that God would ever hear my prayers? Of course he heard it. Well, did God answer the prayer? Now, can you imagine that you have a loved one who in the hour of their death made a request of you that was totally selfless, totally good for somebody else, and totally within your grasp to fulfill, wouldn't you do everything you could to do what they ask you to do? Of course God answered the prayer. But when did he answer it? Well, he didn't answer it immediately. He didn't answer it three days later when Jesus was raised from the dead. And it wasn't raised 50 days after that, after Jesus went back to heaven, and it was not answered when Peter and the other apostles of Jesus stood up to preach on the day of Pentecost of Acts 2. How do I know that? Because when God forgives sin, he forgets about it. Unlike us. When we forgive, we should forget it too. But when God forgives, he forgets it. Hebrews 8, 12 and 13 says that. But when Peter stood up with the others on the Pentecost of Acts 2, God remembered the sin at Calvary. Because a part of Peter's sermon was, you have taken him and with wicked hands crucified and have slain him. God remembered their sin, therefore he had not forgiven it. But when they ask, what shall we do? How shall we respond to the Christ we've killed and the Christ of the cross and the Christ of salvation? How shall we respond? And Peter said, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And that day, 3,000 said yes to Christ. And right there, God forgave. He forgave them when they bowed in humble submission to the yoke of the one that a few days earlier they had killed. Now, do you believe he died for your sins? Then you crucified Christ. And God will forgive you upon the basis of how he forgave them. He will forgive you through the blood of Jesus poured out his life for your forfeited life. He will forgive your sins when you obey the gospel as people did on the beginning day of the church. And after we obey the gospel, we are far from perfect from the human standpoint. And so we keep on walking with God and, and we keep on confessing our sins and as we keep on walking in the light of his word, the blood of Jesus keeps on cleansing us. 1 John 1, 7 and following tells us that. God will forgive. He, he not only will forgive, he is urgent about it. And there's no one so far away from God but that he can be forgiven. If God could forgive those who nailed his sinless son to the cross, he can forgive you. 
But you must say yes to the will of God. Now let me ask this as a close. Where are you right now in your relationship with him? If you are a faithful child of God, may God bless you as you continue to walk with him and to serve him. But if you are a child of God and you know that you're away from the Father, come home tonight. And if you have never yet been forgiven by the blood of Christ because as yet you've never rendered obedience to the gospel, don't let another moment pass because there is an urgency in this hour. Could we help you in your obedience? Then the invitation is that you should come here to the front and tell us what your need is. And everything is in readiness to meet that need and we will help you. Would you respond to the Christ of the cross? Let's stand and sing. What can one